Go ahead. Here. In. Good evening, and thank you for being here with us right now, for those who are in the live stream, and for those who are here. This is the session five, ethical use of artificial intelligence in the healthcare. Yes, in this session, we will talk about all the invisibles and ethical considerations that the artificial intelligence will be in the care of patients, in the healthcare field, and transforming the routines for the clinicians. These panels intend to provide a foundation with a deep view of all artificial intelligence, complexities and opportunities, and learning, exploring legal aspects of patients' rights to privacy and hiding their bias, as well as the, as the intersection of artificial intelligence, ethical use within a global economy. I will introduce the moderator, Dr. Anthony Crochetley, the Dr. Barbara Messina from the School of Nursing, Basilio Mateiro, Associate Dean for Graduate School Studies and Research for the Department of Class Communication, mm -hmm. and the Dean of the School of Nursing and Physician Assistant, Dr. Renee McGill. Thank you. And please, one more thing. If someone wants to may, um, ask a question, please use the microphone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Evening, everyone, and we are so grateful to have you here tonight for our presentation and our panel discussion on an incredibly important topic: the use of artificial intelligence within the healthcare settings from the perspective of an ethical background. I'm going to just offer brief opening remarks and then provide a little more in-depth introduction of our panelists. I'll be introducing our panelists in the order in which they are speaking. And then I'm going to have the most difficult job of trying to make sure our panelists stick to it to their 15 minute discussion time. After which there'll be an opportunity for me to facilitate some questions with them and to allow you members of the audience to ask questions of them as well, to which I encourage, particularly if you are registered for HPR 179 youth of which I see many of you here. Thus, to begin, was to assure ethics can be described in the simplest of contexts as the debate between right and wrong behavior by trying to determine what is the greatest good. How do we determine a set of proper behaviors for individuals, groups, and societies? This transcends numerous topics and settings. Thank you, that's essentially striving to understand what is commonly referred to something you may hear in a philosophy course as the golden rule, or rather, do not do unto others as you do not want done to yourself. <laughs> Rapidly, the complexities of real world applications can skew this rule, which can provide challenges in real world scenarios. See, it is our pleasure this evening to be learning from a panel of experts who can provide us with the context and background with respect to ethics, its application in a biomedical context and in healthcare environments, so we can have a comprehensive understanding of how artificial intelligence and technologies impacts at the decision making and processes mm -hmm. in real world environments. Yay. To the introduction of both our panelists, Hello. Dr. Basilio Lentiero has previously served as the Associate Building for Graduate Studies and Research. Currently, he's the Chair of the Division of Mass Communication at St. John's University. In addition, he's the PhD Director in Multi-Sector Communication and the Master's in International Communication. Dr. Montiero serves as Director of the Institute for International Communication. He is also a social anthropologist with particular interest in sociology and ethical use of technology. Please, please. Dr. Barbara Messina is currently serving as the chair of the Department of Undergraduate Nursing in the Hofstra North Paul School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies. Prior to joining, joining Hofstra, Dr. Messina was the Associate Dean for Transformational Education and the Executive Director of Simulation at SUNY Downstate. While at SUNY Downstate, Dr. Messina served as a panelist on several occasions, sharing expertise on topics such as overcoming disparities in digital health 
and nursing, nursing ethics, among others. And lastly, Dr. Renee McLeod Sorgen, currently serving as the Dean and Professor of the Hofstra Nordhall School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies. Dr. McLeod has faculty appointments both in the Hofstra Northwell School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies and the Donald and Barbara Sucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Dean McLeod is the Director of Mental Ethics at Northwell Health and serves as a course director for Hofstra's Certificate in Clinical Bioethics. Recently, Dean McLeod was named as a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. It is now my absolute pleasure to hand over the discussion for this evening's topic to our panelists, beginning with Dr. Montero. Dr. Montero, as you're ready. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And um, thank you very much for being here. Um, this is a interesting topic, intriguing topic. We have more questions than we have answers. And that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to present more questions, precisely because I'm looking for answers from you. And uh, I think some claims that they have answers, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm going to take you back to 1665. Anything? 1665. It was a very interesting period at the time. So, matters of science, scientific development. It was a period of American scientific progress. And there was a fellow by name Robert Cook, an English polymath. He described the advent of new scientific instruments such as the microscope and telescope. And 665. These two instruments, they let researchers explore previously inaccessible realms and discover things in new ways with prodigious benefits to all sorts of useful knowledge. And for Robert Hooke's modern day successors, the um, letting of artificial intelligence to the scientific toolkit is poised to do the same in the coming years, with, of course, Similarly, the world changing the results. So, in many ways, what we're experiencing with artificial intelligence, they have seen this picture before. They've seen this going before in 1665 with the advent of telescope and the advent of, of microscope. Now, um, the debate about artificial intelligence, for whatever reason, tends to focus on its potential dangers. Algorithmic bias discrimination, the mass destruction of jobs, the even extinction of humanity. Gee, these are kind of predominant questions, Carl. In the 17th century, microscopes and telescopes it. opened up new vistas of discoveries. The result, because of these tool tools, was a rapid progress in astronomy, physics, and other fields of and new inventions from pendulum to steam engines, the prime mover of the industrial revolution. Now, I will present to you, yes. I'd like to provoke you. So I'm provoking my, to, uh, the remarks I'm going to make, they're much more us to think. And so if we can launch ourselves in, this, in search of answers, if there are some useful answers. First of all, what we call artificial intelligence is it really intelligence? Is it perhaps sophisticated statistics assisted by computation? What is intelligence? By all accounts, it's very difficult to define. What does it mean to say, as in the words of one of the top scientists at MIT, Max Tegma says, what is, the, what is this, the blob of matter is intelligent? What does it mean? What does it mean that an object can remember, can compute, and can learn? Now, these are kind of questions that the scientists at MIT are discussing and writing about. Of course, there's definitely there's no agreement. So there is no agreement on what intelligence is, even among the intelligent intelligence researchers. How will AI, artificial intelligence, for example, affect crime, wars, 
we're seeing this already happening in the current wars. Mm-hmm. How will it affect justice, jobs, society, and our own very sense of being human? Our focus this evening is artificial intelligence and tactics. And that too, limited in the confinement to the world of field of healthcare. So allow me to raise some more questions. Why do we have a compulsion to discuss ethics? Everybody's not talking about ethics. It looks like there's some kind of compulsion. Is it perhaps virtue signaling? We do not discuss, for example, the ethics of using a knife, even though recently many people are seriously injured and many are killed with knives. Do we discuss the ethics of knives? Well, I, I firmly believe from I that, and my student here, who is sitting there, she was your former student, and she had my student, St. George. I tell them, we need secret, robust conversations on ethics, not because we'll find nifty solutions, but if it'll keep us honest and outdoors, then always we might. Dis- so what is ethics? What's the difference between morality and ethics? The subject of our discussion, artificial intelligence, is evolving every second date. Thus, how can we apply any ethical standards to something that is evolving, that is something that is emerging? Don't know what's going to happen. How can we establish sort of the standards of what's right or what's wrong? Granted that agency in all of us either those developing on the technology or using technology must strive to do no harm, which is the, some of the foundational principles of healthcare ethics. There is a thought that some Urbillian type of agency must establish God leaders to keep an eye on this withdrawn child, as we call it, artificial intelligence. So, so we'll better get you. And who will guard these gatekeepers? We tend to think of, of ethics as something monolithic. We know there are different schools of ethics with different emphasis. I'll just go through some examples. There are virtue ethics, which focuses on the good of other people. Deontological ethics, which focuses on following universal moral laws, such as not lie. Don't cheat, don't steal. For example, imagine I'm a computer scientist and I come to know that there is a movement among the scientists to deploy nuclear missiles. Should I hack the, this, this system in order to avoid it, deploying nuclear missiles? But think about it. Then we have something called Kantian, the amount of Kant, the amount of Kantian ethics, which are duty based. What is my duty? And of course, most of us practice what is known as the utilitarian ethics, consequentialist situation ethics, relativism, teleological ethics, what is good, what desirable, what does it end to achieve? And the question I have for us is how do we understand the duty? versus morality. How do we understand ethics versus morality? Sometimes, most of the times, they are used interchangeably. Morality is understood as personal and normative, most of the times. Ethics is seen as a good or bad. Ethics is considered as some kind of it, but there's an expectation that a community standards and models are, we tend to see as a personal understanding of my morality. That's but my morals. One of the universal health care principles in healthcare is do no us. However, what is what is harm? What is harm? Do we all uniformly understand what harm the other is harm? See, we know all this power treatment has some kind of side effects. Is that harm un- unethical? The side effects are harmful. 
So what I point out when raising this question is by pointing out to the complexity of Ishta. Anyone who tries to rush to find an ethical answer will start. We know also, and I'm talking now, that as a sociologist of technology, technology brings societal transformations. We see this in our lives, with all the devices that they're using. Sociology brings about transformation of society. Societal transformation. At this in turn, it will compel us to ask all the questions, such as modern modernity, ancient ethics. Modern ethics, knowledge, and ancient morality. Kind of studying with that. We know, for example, that the innovative algorithms and mathematical complexity can be extremely seductive. And when trying to build ever more complex models of the real world, some of us will be swept away from a tidal wave of ideas and developments. Perhaps in the process, we lose ethical concerns because it would be such a so euphoric to our these things and our friends. So, some of these ideas and developments will ensure that they are crowded in real life applications which will need ethical considerations. The question comes who's good? An opening remarks by moderate Anthony Kate mentioned the set the uh, ethics he said to debate, determine what is right than and wrong, to look for greater good. Greater good according to who? By whose standards? Plato, he would say, he would teach us all endeavors must start with a moral question. Well, and not be a personal moral question, at least fun, fit, engaging in the starting the endeavor. I, by one moral, ask this, by, at least for my understanding, ask the moral question. So moral decision, male probability, we know the recent developments at MIT, perhaps the AI algorithm is still using infancy. They are trying to see if the uh, algorithm can actually do moral decision can deliberate and they looks like they are onto something but still is in the infancy Again, in the other the pesky question that i want to raise here do you have to be right to use the term the right choice well this is the right choice we have to make the right choice what do we mean number one by choice okay. why are we choosing it and which is which is not in fear of more praiseworthy in a particular context. So this context may not be praiseworthy in other contexts. As humans, we do not have a general agreement of on what is a right choice. We don't have an agreement in the world's agreement. Yeah. Well, I'm sure to us, you know, are familiar, some of you are familiar with those who have been computer science who are doing the Asimov's laws. Really, um, so as you know, a set of laws that a robot must never violate humans. As he would say, a robot may not injure a human being, or to election, allow a human being to come to, come to harm. A robot must obey orders given by human beings, except where such orders conflict with the first law. It means it's uh, injuring human beings. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. It's kind of what you call the guard rails established but named the of the robots. Now here, that the ideological ethics, again, they think you to the various schools of thought, from the ethics that we have. So here what we have in Asimov's law is the deontological ethics. Right actions are chosen based on specific rules regardless of consequences of the action. Earlier I said, most of us, pedestrians that we are, we use utilitarian ethics. That's our popular approach. <clears throat> now, as we are concerned about ethics, the, we try to say, we we'll talk about, let me do some training in ethics. We have to give training to have in ethics. Let us have training workshops about ethics. Personally, I will see this problem with that word. <laughs> 
Sometimes we say something like, oh, I'm, I'm trained in psychology. I'm trained in the law. It's something we train athletes to develop the people's skill. I am others. It is not about training, it is about education. Then to car, then to chairman, to be educated. Educating to educating to yourself on way of thinking. Yeah. So training you cannot for way of thinking. You can be good uh, a certain maybe with the training for a uh, baseball player. But educating to develop a way of thinking, <laughs> educating to about ethics, to develop a disposition of heart, and of course an ethical virtue. Right now, as we speak, if you, as of just yesterday, it's seven o'clock, we've some interesting news there. A major controversy is brewing among the scientists. Integrated information theory, by all accounts, we know, is somewhat promising avenue of research into the nature of consciousness. I have I learned these things because I have a couple of colleagues who are experts or are interested in researching consciousness. It aims to provide. <laughs> This um, uh, integrated information theory we have to provide a way of assessing whether a given system, such as, for example, human brain, standby, artificial intelligence, is conscious using a mathematical measure of how the system deals with information. <coughs> now, it is controversial, apparently. It's obviously controversial. This kind of is, the, is this, um, this uh, con to have a consciousness. Apparently, if they come to these logical conclusions, it makes some strange claims, such as the circuit boards in our hard drives. In certain configurations, would be conscious. So, a group of hundred scientists around the world signed a letter a couple of days ago, describing integrated information theory as pseudoscience. That is a loaded term. It's a heavy accusation. Pseudoscience, saying among other things that if it were tried, the theory would have a direct impact on a wide variety of ethical issues, including healthcare related issues, despite I started to mention this here. And of course, some of you may know, neuroscientist Eric Holt argues that just a couple of days ago, he wrote a, a letter challenging the scientists, this hundred scientists. Hmm. Science, he says, should be judged on whether it is true or not, not on political implications. Among the scientists, there is a sense that self-destruction is upon us. Superintelligence will drive the Anthropocene species, us, extinct by way of cyborgs, held as a much faster race pace. Andrew Kasperson, by the Wallach of the Carnegie Council, advocate a reset in ethical thinking about artificial intelligence, arguing that Giant technology investments are once again building systems with little consideration for their potential effect on people. In the current artificial physical intelligence discourse, we perceive a widespread failure to appreciate why it is so important to champion human dignity. There is a risk of creating a world in which meaning and value are stripped of from human life. Chris Gillard and Peter Warabong write very poignantly. It's a failure, the sense of imagination, to think that we must learn to live with artificial intelligence just because it is built, just because it's dead. Yes, you all know, technologies exist outside the rooms where the ethicist he has. I mean, court. Let me come here with an interesting court from an interesting person, not a scientist. This particular person, now a couple of weeks ago, on a cafe in a New York State, said, ambivalence is where real life happens. We hate you. I mean, the point of it all is that we are not one thing or the other. We are human beings and we are short. And you know who said that? Group shields. So let me add a comment by a quote from Brooks Smith. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Montero. And with that, I am going to now ask that Dr. Barbara Messina offer her remarks. And as we pivot to Dr. Messina, I just wanted to offer a reflection on something that Dr. Montero referenced, which was perception. Specifically, who will handle what is good and according to whom and the idea or the concept behind what perception 
plays, how big of a role perception plays with respect to ethical decision making. As a matter of fact, and in 2022, in a position statement released by the American Nurses Association, specifically on the ethical uses of artificial intelligence, I'm going to offer a two sentence reading from that document, which is applicable to anyone here who has a future aspiration to be a clinician, regardless of disciplinary area. Decision making at the systems and population health level is informed by acquired population data and can negatively impact nursing processes and intuition in some settings. As an example, population and system level data mined from domain the submitting with significant systematic racism and bias will likely carry this same bias into implementation, which is contrary to ethical nursing practice indicating that as in, it is incredibly important that as we continue to expand the use of artificial intelligence to be mindful of the data streams which are feeding in. And with that, Dr. Messina, I welcome you to take the podium. But do you believe this I might just start? Thank our city president um, who uh, starts speaking and to our provost um, who will um, who supports the symposium and brings this very important topic to the front. So thank you so much for the support and mostly to the audience, to you who come to participate. So my thought um, is in a, and personal um, uh, level of interest has to do with implicit bias. And how does implicit bias impact artificial intelligence. So one of the postulates of artificial intelligence is they say to us that using a machine to make decisions is justified and argued that machines don't have bunnies. So therefore the data that's computed in a machine will not continue to propagate the bias that we may have. But by the end of this discussion, I'm going to um, hopefully bring to your uh, consciousness what is artificial intelligence, what is implicit bias, and how artificial intelligence can also increase um, implicit bias and why does that gap of healthcare disparities. So my background is I've been a nurse. I was, I have the uh, distinct to think distinction of saying I have been a nurse for 50 years this June. Mm -hmm. So I have seen many different tools that have been brought into the healthcare of arena. And that with each tool that is introduced in the healthcare arena, as well as the world, is that we need to use it intelligently and judiciously. So what is implicit bias? I'm going to give you a little overview of what is implicit bias. Implicit bias is also known as unconscious bias, implicit prejudice, or implicit attitude, which is a negative attitude that we are not consciously aware of. <laughs> and it's targeted against a specific group, culture, race, religion, or gender. And the danger of it is that we are not aware of it. So individuals' perceptions and behaviors can be influenced by that implicit bias, even though we're not aware of them. We practice what's called evidence-based practice. And all of you, despite your discipline of study, you are all researchers, you're being getting a scholar. So you're going to be conducting research and how can implicit bias impact research and the data that emerges that we will use, whether it's in business, whether it's in sociology, or whether I will use in healthcare, and then I'm going to teach my patients and that I will use to teach my students. We have a belief that, well, scientific and medical research is thought to be free from outside influence. Science is shaped 
by the time and place it is carried out. Research, it all starts with, what do we say? It all starts with a question. Our question drives our research. So research questions are developed and answers are contingent upon the culture and the institutions of society. So scientific research is not without implicit bias. And because the data that's inputted into these machines and machine learning is data that is derived from Asian charts. So how we as healthcare providers, if we have an implicit bias, that's going to be written into the chart. That language is then going to be translated into an input and machine learning. As is the data that is obtained from scientific research studies. As a matter of fact, a recent study found that cardiovascular events have really not decreased and the disparity in healthcare in cardiovascular management has really not significantly changed. So I thought, well, how could that be true? If, if we're using an AI and AI is artificial intelligence and we hear all the time that artificial intelligence can do all these things that we can't do. It can compute data. It has deep learning. It can make associations quickly and learn from that and apply them, things that we could never do. How can we still have disparities in healthcare? Because that bias should be gone, but, but it's not because the data that's imprinted into that machine is data that we humans have created. And we have our own unconscious bias, even though we're not aware of it. I just read about, I'm very interested in cardiovascular disease and specifically the disparities between cardiovascular health between men and women, and especially women of color. To this day, studies have found that if a man enters an emergency room complaining of uh, chest pain or um, exhibits objective signs and symptoms of cardiovascular disease, a male patient is two to five times more likely to have a referral to a cardiologist and a woman. And it increases for women of color. Women of color are five times more likely to die of breast cancer because their treatment protocols are different. African Americans are less likely to receive transplants. All of this is predicated upon our guidelines, which we're getting from artificial intelligence. That's how we operate. Evidence-based practice. Here's the evidence. <clears throat> Here's what it says. Artificial intelligence is telling us that these machines are far smarter than we are. And there we're going lies the problem. One of the key components of research is critical analysis and appraisal of the data. Is it consistent with what we as the experts know? And what concerns me, and it concerns the American Medical Association, is that we have what's called automation bias. It's called artificial intelligence. So as Dr. Montiero said, what is intelligence? And there are multiple definitions. The American Medical Association is so concerned that we may just take whatever the machine spits out as true because these machines are far intelligent than I. They can compute and give us data far faster than we can and make this analysis in associations that we never could. 
But if a medical expert looks at this data and says, gee, this doesn't seem to be really consistent with what I know and what I've seen, but this is a machine. And the machine is far smarter than I. So maybe this is something that just hasn't been brought to the foreshock yet. The American Medical Association has recently um, created a proposal to change the term from artificial intelligence to augmented intelligence. It's augmenting what we know. It does not have what we know. We think it. we have intuition and we react to the environment. And we're able to take that data and do Pfizer and up the increases and not just accept it because it's there. As they say in the New York Times, not all the truth is fit to clean. So if I say with any tool that has come around, whether it's fire, right? Which when fire was first discovered, it gave us the bunch in cooked our food. Fire is a tool that we can use for the greater good, or we can use it for destruction. But Dr. Montiero spoke about a knife. We can use a scalpel in the operating room for the greater good, to excise disease organs, to help place people back if they have a tumor, spray of iron bones, suture ruptured organs. Well, we can take that same instrument and we can thus be on. Artificial intelligence, if used appropriately, can do greater good. There have been multiple studies when it comes to images that the accuracy with which a machine examines diagnostic imaging is far more accurate than the human eye. However, even that needs to be examined critically by us. Unsurprisingly, or not surprisingly, there's been a plethora, tons of studies examining our patient outcomes. When the healthcare problem just simply takes whatever the stem out of the machine spits out, <laughs> guides the practice, takes care of the patient. No change. A very good Jewish. However, when the healthcare provider takes that data, examines it critically, we have to hide in the water thinking and examines that data critically and appraises it, analyzes it, and looks at the patient. That was where the change for greater quality patient outcomes occurs. So if nothing else, I ask you to please remember to use artificial intelligence, get intelligent labs. Thank you very much, Dr. Mansayab. I think that was very, very enlightening and it was certainly appreciated. Some of the things that you spoke about, which resonated with me, spoke to the critical analysis of data allows us to have an idea or an understanding of how automation bias plays a role in a way in which artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence, as you alluded to, can have a role in individuals making decisions. You referenced the American Medical Association, the AMA, and their position on AI within healthcare settings, and they have outlined a series of avenues and ways in which AI can be beneficial in the healthcare environment. But they do speak for the need for transparency in a fair in a variety of different aspects with respect to data usage and how that data usage goes about being d disseminated with AI. In addition, they speak about the need for stakeholder insights. And this is something that is required throughout the entirety of all individuals who make up the stakeholder group of a healthcare system and or setting. With that, I now ask and invite the Dean of our school, Dr. Renee McLeod-Sorgen, 
to please offer her insights on this incredibly important topic. Eva Clark. Thank you, Dr. Porcelli, and I want to welcome you all. And thank you to my esteemed colleagues for their talks. I want to be slightly different. I'm going to tell you the science, but we happen to be at Hofstra University. World-renowned liberal arts education and the science. And I also too want to thank President Poser for a brand new building that's called the Science and Innovation Center. And yet we say science and innovation. We don't say science and fear. So for those of you that are hearing my voice and those of you that are sitting in the audience, close your eyes. Think about a time before you blur. I'm going to take us back to George Bromos, the 1980s. I'm also going to go back to the former centuries, as my colleague did, to Frankenstein and Mary Shelley. And did we know that Frankenstein was the physician? Not the creature. The creature was called monster. And I think as we talk tonight, and you can open your eyes now, because I know that you thought about a time before you were born, you didn't think about the smart phone in your pocket that has the ability to do predictive analytics, predictive analytics so well that after this talk, we will be able to get a lift or an Uber in less than five minutes, have it charge us what we can afford to pay and get the right number of drivers here at the Hofstra University to take us home. Fifteen years ago, we couldn't have thought about that. Twenty years ago, we couldn't have thought about that until the creation of the iPhone. And now I'm going to bring us back to the topic. I am an ethicist, and I've been an ethicist for ten years. And yes, there is no right or wrong, as my colleague Dr. Montero said. There are hard decisions, clinical decisions, decision-making algorithms that the human mind cannot fathom or cannot think of with enough. We cannot take humanity out of health guests. But what we should remember is that ethics is the legislation of morality that sometimes gets created after the technology. So whether we're talking about the first heart surgery, whether we're talking about the dialysis machine, whether we're talking about a ventilator that breathes for us, or machines that we have that can replace oxygen into the bloodstream people do not have it. All of that is technology. And all of that technology, as my colleague said, has a beneficent use, good use, a non maleficent use, harm, and requires precision to look at those decisions. But I also want to say that, yes, this is a global economy. This is a global world. And here at Hofstra, there's a diverse student body. Not one size fits all. I mean, I agree with Dr. Messina that all of these tools can have biases if they're not represented at the community. But, as my colleague Dr. Montero is, a social anthropologist or a communication anthropologist, I'm going to give you a study, a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, with more than 700 clinicians, physicians, and nurses. The response was for patients to actually ask questions of each of those clinicians and get a response. On the one hand, the clinician responded, and that spots came to your telephones. And at other hands, chat GPT was probably, and that response came to your front. All came from your trusted clinician. Who do you think patients trust? The algorithms or the human being? If you say the algorithm, you would be right. 60% of chat GPT was empathetic responded in the language that patients wanted to hear. I'll be 21% of clinicians work. And yet, my colleagues will say to you, put the human there. But human beings have fallible uses. 
Human beings need to be more efficient. Human beings need to be more innovative. And in that rush to do it, sometimes we're short tempered. Sometimes we don't use the right words. Sometimes we don't have the right empathy. But time and time again, the machine behaves the same way because this program is to be the same way. So when is the fear that we've been talking about? It's the, this idea of intelligence, of it learning. I also want to bring to you Martha Nussbaum, who talked about the moral status of animals, that someday an animal might replace human beings, that they may somehow have sentience, that they have feelings, that they're capable of pain at least such racial. In other words, we as human beings personify and put human personalities and human traits on others. And now we're putting it on the computer. But why? Because we want the computer to be able to critically think. But I'm going to tell you as a former student that when I was in your seat and doing my research as an undergraduate student, I was in a very plain slice of library using and learning to use the Dewey Decimal System. And it took me probably three months to pull 30 articles. Well, but a decade later, when I was doing my master's and needed to do that research, there was a such thing as a word processor. And maybe it took me three months to pull 30 articles. When I completed my doctorate at that wonderful thing of a computer, I was able to pull 400 resources in two weeks. Do I still require the critical thinking? Yes. But Did I still need to do decision making? Yes. But I was more efficient. So now let's get back to the ethics and healthcare. And as the ANA and AMA warn us to, yes, be careful with implicit bias. To, yes, we have to make sure that these algorithms are representative. Yes, we need to enroll more patients in, in research studies. Yes, we need to expand with diverse realities. But these algorithms that we use have existed. How long have they existed? Hundreds of years. If we can go back thousands of years to Aristotle, these principles that we talk about, respect to persons, justice, beneficence versus non millennials They were ethical frameworks of decision-making. Now those ethical frameworks of decision-making come with large data sets that are now decision aids. And again, decision aids. To allow me to have predictive analytics of how you will do but just because we have predictive analytics to science of it, the innovation of it requires us to be patient-centered, person-centered, to look at our cultural preferences, to look at how we've responded in the past, to look at all of those things, so that, yes, in the words of the way we went among but the one small step for mankind, for mankind, not the shoe cut. And as men that make the machines, it is men that create the decision algorithms. And it's you that is going to use higher order thinking and critical thinking in an efficient way to make sure we utilize these tools, not just for what's here in this country, but globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Matsat. That was fantastic. And once again, to Dr. Quintero and Dr. Messina for your insights on this very important topic. After hearing all the panelists, I kind of, my perception or my perspective is that perhaps instead of focusing on the golden thing, uh, that philosophical term that was initially approached at the beginning of this evening's presentation, uh, where the suggest or support that you do not do unto others as you do not wish to be done unto you. Perhaps with respect to this topic, focusing more on the golden moon, 
or the desirable middle between two extremes is a good path or avenue forward uh, with respect to the use of the AI in healthcare settings. To begin uh, the, the question period of this evening's session, I just want to begin by asking, utilizing the context that Dean McLeod mentioned uh, with regard to well, um, the Frankenstein analogy, how do we ease the angst of utilizing AI in technology and within healthcare settings? How is that something that and we as a profession, from an education standpoint, or from a uh, practical clinical standpoint, can be done? So I, I will say with transparency and accountability. I think far too long, you know, and I'm going to say this on the perspective of the clinician, far too long patients came in student and office and we dictated the kick. And we did it based on books that we learned or on evidence. And it took 17 years in general to put evidence from research to actually into that exam. Well, now patients are coming with information that they've got. And so we have to sit together and partner what is misinformation and what is true information. And by being transparent with the decision aids and algorithms that we are using, patients are able to do that at home. And so I did a lot of obstetrics and gynecology and patients come in now actually knowing exactly how many weeks pregnant they are, what are their genetic risks, they've done their research, and then now we can have a partnership from a stronger area. I think we should be afraid of these tools, but realize that they open the doors for us to have deeper explorations as to our risks and benefits. Thank you very much. And interprofessional exchange is something that is emphasized constantly in healthcare environments. In what ways can healthcare benefit from partnering with representatives from backgrounds such as communications or other fields to help build and foster on what what has just been described and education to the patient of how AI is being utilized to ultimately benefit them and to benefit the practices that help them. Not, I mean, you know, like every tool has its own pros and cons. Depends very much on plus use, how we use, what kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of the understanding we have, and our own sense of of uh, models. How do we use the tool? Like you know, somebody wants to use the, the knife, but someone the good models says, okay, uses in a kind of judicious way. I think it also depends very much on our own formation and our own education and our own maturity. If we don't have that, uh, you know, the AI will not be terribly helpful. So it's kind of a partnering someone to, to what do I bring to the table of the AI? That is actually a very important question. I want formation, I want intellectual formation, the emotional formation is very important. Also our maturity, dealing with this. Now, one thing very obvious now is looking at the whole information is available. And the AI seems to be um, becoming more and more useful for healthcare purposes. The problem is ability to do study larger data, as uh, Shuma Cloud was pointing. And uh, so, what, because human, human, we have our own limitations. We could not, and as it is not only that, but also not only data, but also the examining the level of death. For so example, I began by saying to you, 1666, the telescope, fancy microscope. But before that, you could not see. With now, microscope is allowed to see something that our naked eye could not see. So today, the AI can do something that our human brain was not capable of, is stretching itself away. So there is that benefit that if the AI does help, and this ability of, well, so health which includes gain this uh, data with what allows in few weeks, so you, it, this much data, you can have a large sample of, of um, studies that the larger the sample, the better the results you get. So that is possible. With human beings, we could do it probably for a year, but now within a few weeks, then do thousands and probably more than many thousands to help with the, uh, the, the help of the art. 
So there are benefits to me. How do we use these tools? That is how I think the final is going to be uh, the, the way to live it. You know, yes, it is here. How do you eat it? I should say that I should be telling my students about that we have a responsibility to in the educate ourselves about these matters to become responsible citizens. Uh, that is our ongoing formation. And our education cannot be stopped after the degree. So that Mona is in our PhD program, uh, after finishing my doctorate and say, okay, now from start. No, I think that continues. And especially those of us who had uh, the privilege and the opportunity to do our doctorates, we are perennially students. We are forever students. That's one thing that we have learned to be students, asking, keep asking, it becomes almost a compulsion to keep asking questions. And that is our, our muscle memory, our muscles to great never our time. And so I think everyone must be today in this kind of thing. And to make me at least for the, in how I see. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Montero. The next question that I, that I was thinking about to ask, um, this is with respect to mobile disparities. How can AI be leveraged to overcome disparities in healthcare? How can it be utilized to assist with alleviation as much as balance all of disparities? Well, I think that, that I'd like to um, be able to answer that question. One of the things that we need to do is we need to look at data tools privacy. Right? Where did that data come from? Because in order for us to analyze, to see, is the data valid and reliable, it's a tool. AI is a tool. I say, instead of making it augmented intelligence, it's right. augmented inquiry. It's helping us gather the information. And just like we would do the old fashioned way when I was, you know, going for my doctoral degree or even now, we very old fashioned, I'll look something up, I get my article, I critique it and look at it. And I so analyze the data. Is it valid and reliable? So the data that's put into the machine, we need to examine. And I think this would be hint hint. Um, a great thing for research, you're young, you're researchers, you're the people who are coming up, you're gonna drive the research and the community and this country. One of the things that you can do is look at those data links. Things that can the data. What's the transparency of that data? How did the machine make the decisions? As Dean McLeod said, that patients have the ability now to go on portals and they have the patient portals and they look things up. So the patient's going to ask you questions. They're going to want to know how was the decision made? What's the transparency of the data? What was the process? How can the machine examine the data? And how was that data selected? So when you reduce those disparities, one of, one of the studies I read too, it said that, you know, with, um, that the social determinants of health, that's something that, um, is put out every 10 years by the Surgeon General. And what they do is our, our health care has shifted from acute care to preventative care. And the social determinants of how for that really started in the 70s when the Surgeon General started looking at things and said it's the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. So now we look at the community as a whole. What did we do? So the examining those, they only went into zip code areas. It was limited to zip code areas of the affluentists. So the disparities in healthcare continue. They didn't go into that data, wasn't analyzing it, looking at zip code areas of people who were of lower incomes and living in areas where it was industry. And there was like real regulation of the wastes and the outputs. So the, the, the data that was utilized to guide our decision making and all of these, we need to remember hard guides. They're not absolute. It's a guide. It's up to us as the human being, as the healthcare provider 
to analyze that data, look at that data, and say, how does that apply to this patient in this particular instance? That so one way to, dis to decrease those disparities is to have an interprofessional team. Because all of us look at these different my community. And it really came to highlight to me when, when I was working on my dissertation and I said, oh boy, I'm going to go to my chair and I've got this laid out. This, is, this question is so incredible and just it's not to sock sauce the nut. And he took one looking at me said, did you think of that? I can't eat at all. I never thought of that. Yes. But then my other member of my committee, he said, well, did you think of this? So it's by having that community of people where we all come from a different perspective to look at something, it can create an incredible question, help create incredible research, which can then be utilized to decrease healthcare disparities and create the logarithms and guidelines where we're able to provide the best person care. Thank you very much, Dr. Messina. In essence, the responses that we've been receiving to the questions that have been posed essentially are suggesting that the establishment of, of guardrails and education regarding the use of AI in healthcare settings is a logical and beneficial step for its continued and expanded use. The question then becomes, where or how do we see AI's expanded use in healthcare settings in the foreseeable future? So I think that's interesting. We've really been talking about communities of inquiry. And from your question, it assumes that it has not always been here. No. Um, and I think that we know that this has always been there, that AI algorithms, whether we give it an enslaver, it's there. The one thing that I do want to pose to us, because this, we are at the of learning, is that it is not only going to happen in the academic arm, it is not only going to happen in the practice arts, it is society that is going to put this up. And I'm going to give you one example of that. Um, recently, my daughter decided that I should do Ancestry.com. Her mother's day gift to me was to swap me and send it in. I said to her, we know where the family is from. It's from a really small town. I can tell you the streets are still named after you grab parents. Well, when the test came back in six weeks, there there were about 1,500 people that matched to my identity. And then I got curious of a researcher. And in the six months of doing this research, I found a Tuskegee Airmen. I found where we were with 1700s. All of these things I found. And yet, I also found a second cousin that lived a half a mile away from me. That is the power of the internet. That is the power of learning. That and so communities of learning are moving beyond the walls of what we thought, and that's what happens with that dix. We have to now not contain it. So to your point, how we put these communities of learning and use technology to go globally to actually analyze this data across all zip codes for diverse communities is where we are. And our gap will not come algorithms but come relationships, relationships and scholarship, relationships and community, and relationships and family. So thank you, Katira. But I, I'm glad this was good cousin. I don't know what else. Had a pull up. Look at the best See, thank you, Team the Cloud. You perfectly described the societal context for change, which is something that is going to continue as more and more individuals have an understanding that AI has not just only started to be used, but has been utilized, has been built on culture dives. As I thank the panelists for the opportunity to have had this discussion facilitated this evening, I also want to recognize that the members of the audience are also allowed to ask questions of our panel. So I'd like to pause briefly and ask or invite anyone with questions for our panel members to please come on up to the microphone. You're great here in the middle idol. 
and then we'll happily answer questions you have. Let me do this again. Not help us. See. Sure. Well, it's okay, Tona. If the same space, you could ask the question. Let's see how it's true. Bellish. Bellish. Steve, I'll have one. Steve, me. May you don't go so many of them. Buckings. One thing. He couldn't be rather. But he's a big one. So, um, you get eight. How are you? I'll go to get hurry. Go ahead. Oh, three. Just, uh, touching base on what you guys said. Ah, uh, what do you think that, um, not a negative question, but like AI in school, what do you think, uh, a feasible punishment is for someone who uses it, not to the extent of writing to another paper for them, but to really just like, you know, like, like chat GPT, using it, um, just for sessions or resource. I did cartoons. Those are negative. Was I have thought about it for a bit and I'm disgusted also with your colleagues okay. and my own personal disposition. The inclination at recession is the thing I thought about punishing the student, but making it a teachable market. Yes, it ain't that. And it takes time. I meant that. But then to for whatever reason say, okay, we didn't use a plagiarism and therefore been expelled from school. It was big. Well, actually, can we make that into a teachable market? Can we, that becomes in certain uh, uh, yeah. for, for transformations, for kind of further engagement, further discussions. And of course, it's time consuming. It is, uh, it takes uh, effort, but I think it's worth it. I mean, that's why we are in the business of education. It's not a business, actually, we are education. They do kind of to pull it out from each other. It's not simply putting something in the hands. It's not a spending. Yes. So uh, I would give belief on that, so, you know, that is student. Methodically. Now, secondly, the other thing is about this big class. How are we going to introduce in the classroom? I think um, one of the things that um, with this technology, it is in the hands of almost everyone. It is no longer contained in some department by some super specialist, super brainiac, so can do this. No, this is anyone on the street. You have, a, you have a little device in your hand, you can do it. So you don't need a PhD to understand or play the term. Touch you pretty on anything. Just so I think, given the fact that it is such a um, I'm being built of your accessibility to it, and I'm almost everyone said, I think the challenge for us is to say, okay, instead of putting limitations, we have to we have learned this. So when the telephone cell phones came, they started to say no cell phones in the classes, in the end of it. So with the computer step mountains, and we lost the battle. The, pro- the teacher, the professor, lost the papers. And it was, it was, like this. It was pointed. Now, on the contrary, we made all uh, tensions in the class because of those street. You know, the, but I think we have learned from game uh, to how to if you incorporate, how to accommodate, how to get this uh, thing to myself. So you kind of try to, I think each professor has to be, you know, very dear, or has to know she gives these are our students in front of the in front of the classroom. So get to know that. I tell my faculty as a general department, get to know the story of your student before you. Not just asking with a name. Get a story. What is your story? And you connect that way. And then afterwards you would know how to it takes time and effort. But it's worth it. That's why in school becomes not only so you get a degree, but also becomes a transformation. I stood on study. Thank you for that question. That was so great. But to men's hair, I said we were going to be a question, right? Um, that, is, that is, um, you know, John Nash came up with game theory, and when he did, it fell for the wall. It, 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 you know, got him, you know, at a scientific prize. But now our students learn game theory in high school. So as you were talking about, you know, chat GPT and using it, what are the real tools that are really concerning? And it's not just about, you know, confidentiality or plagiarism. It's really that we want them to think. So in thinking about John Nash and game theory, and now they probably know game theory wonderful. And, you know, what are we hoping from, you know, tools like chat, cheap, see, to push this generation even further than we were 40 years ago? 
the honest answer is I don't know. That's the issue. I have no clue. Uh, but, but I like to think aloud and see with that. Because <laughs> I, mean, I can think about it, like exchange ideas with my colleagues. Because it's a matter of concern. Do I have enough products? I have no answer. And um, uh, because number one, technology is evolving. This particular one is evolving exponentially at a very fast rate. I don't think anyone can just catch up with it. But today, the younger generation, older than guys, are much more intuitively better prepared with technology than my generation. So it comes to you automatically after making an effort to learn. You, you, you just, somehow it is there. And so you, that is uh, being, being born in, that, uh, in, that, in the world of technology. And so, Let me how are we going to work this out? Okay. Well, I don't have an answer. I don't think anybody has an answer. It is just a question of being open and looking for the greatest good of the students. I, I say, you know, get engaging the students, make them partners in the, in the learning process. That's how I try to approach my, my class. When my students become my partners. I mean, we see it all sit in a row. I don't like to sit like this. She says, okay, man, I always say, I'm here a facilitator. And of course, I have the luxury of teaching undergraduate and doctoral levels. So, so I trust my students. I said, okay, teach me. I will learn from you as well. And even when I, when I teach undergrad classes, um, there are certain pop cultures, for example, I know nothing about it. So if I, am, I kind of grew up in my little bubble of classical music. But uh, I asked them, teach me about pop culture. And they get the end of the coin. So we, the fact that they become part of the learning process, uh, I find it fascinating that in my who is probably not experimenting in the classroom, I, I, I see, you know, supposed to find them, find my students that they want something to, they have something to contribute. And as long as I, I as a professor or a teacher class, you mm-hmm. can honestly, you know, in a genuine way, let them know that uh, you're know, teaching me something, learning something funny. I better learn something because you, are, you have knowledge that I don't have. I mean, that is technology, perfectly this specific, but which comes to you so intuitively. Popular culture, for example. And, to learn to, and once we have this uh, learning partnership, talking about learning communities, our learning community is our classroom is a learning community. Sure. But the classroom is a learning community. How we can make that learning community? That is how should be, at least as a, as a professor, should be my concern to make an environment where students feel like I'm part of this community. And uh, some will be, depending on their personalities, they will be brigadiers, others will be quiet and split off. And we have to learn somehow to understand, to understand that when we get to know them. That's why I said, you know, I have to know the story of my student. I don't have sign ways of knowing. So, so those are kind of environment side turns they will be you have to develop. It cannot be you'll probably be successful in teaching. I'm here, I'm I know everything, I'm gonna teach you otherwise I will swim it. That uh, it is not going to be a way of learning as well. That's a not take a um, mm-hmm. students will say, oh, I don't need it. I can still go and get a job properly and I don't need a degree to um, work for you know yeah that's a little competition. I tell them myself. You know, go a lot in one side. You know, Apple, go, yeah, when, uh, Apple is having the university, uh, Amazon is having university, Google is having the university. Do we need St. John's? Do we need all stuff? I don't know. So, what does future be lower? Keep and solve. So, this is different. So, they have to make. I, my deepest belief is, as a professor, as someone who is in education for a long time, for over 30 some years, that our learning communities, as a classroom, is my learning community. I'm learning from them, we're learning it's happening. And so, uh, that, that is car thing. You have to do it fast far. Thank you. Yes. That's the same kind of thing. Thank you very much, Dr. Monsiero and Beans and Cloud. Do we have any other questions from members of our audience? Hello. How are you? I have a question about like the feasibility of like genetics and artificial intelligence. Like, 
I'm sure you guys heard about like CRISPR and how genetic splicing, how to be how can that coexist with artificial intelligence. I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Messina. This was actually her area of research. Well, I think it's helpful to think about why we push technology, even in our last exchange. So with CRISPR, if we thought about it, it was to have better crops, to have better food sources. And one of the things that was really concerning to us as an ethicist is when there was research done unbeknownst to the family that actually to excise a gene that could cause HIV. And we would all think that that's really great. You're going to prevent a whole population from having an acquired immunodeficiency in HIV. But in doing so, we actually made a change in the genetic code that created what we call as mosaicism. So that not every part of your gene would express the same gene. There would be differences. And so as we do things as a community without sharing it, or thinking about the repercussions, or thinking about the privacy, or thinking about the confidentiality, then it is also opening up Pandora's box as to what could be the side effects. Mm -hmm. So some of the great side effects to those crops is that they left to office, they think some of the side effects on that was, of course, the illnesses and the burdens of disease. So I think, as Dr. Matero said, there's always a balance. Um, and certainly, I'm really looking forward to the time when we can make exercise one protein and remove ourselves ever having sickle cell disease. We have to remember that genetically that illness was caused by the fact that the people who didn't have sickle cell survived um, malaria. And people who didn't have the chain, the yeah. So we just have to be careful as we look at genetics that we need to have the whole picture. Dr. Nesvina? And thank you for being with her. So, who is Jim Flex? Remember, you know, there's your phenom and your team. So, every time we change those, we don't change the DNA, but we change the way the um, alignment of the galaxies you call. But when I was. Um, faculty at Stony Brook, and I was working with a lot of the awesome. My, my background is really in pharmacology and pastels. And I worked with a lot of the um, MDs who were going for the doctorate and they would study the knockoff genes and pull all this sort of stuff. And it all looked great. But in fact, we must do a little judiciously. We can't just take something and say, this is great, we'll knock this off and then they won't have diabetes. They'll pop their sauce and they're going to have that disease. Whenever there's a, um, you, you make a change, there's a whole change that goes, that's going to happen subsequently to the change that you made. So we have to be very careful when we do it. We have to do it judiciously. So we have to think about um, like with anything, especially in medicine, you know, whether you, I'm um, like, history of covering them, what's the risk and what's the benefit? Mm -hmm. So what's the benefit of deleting this gene? What's going to happen subsequent to that? Is it going to cause me no problems? Or, well, this, um, really thought, you know, chronic disease in their West. So it meets a wonderful question, and it's, it's extremely complex. I mean, you know, I, I think about um, genetics and um, artificial intelligence and legacy like, technology, which was actually on a ground and area and focus was uh, assisted reproductive technologies. Try it, can be used in the brain or brain, cannot be used in the brain or good. And if we can take it, is it ethically or morally right? to have a parent come in and say, I'm not a boy or I'm not a girl. Or I'd want a child to have blue eyes or breasts and fish. It's not loving an episode by teenies. So, uh, so, you know, these are all societal decisions based on a lot of complexities. So in terms of the genetics, I, again, I really don't have an answer for that. I think just whatever we do, you know, like genetically modifying sure we'll see all of this sort of stuff. What's the venison? 
and what's, you know, the really difficult. What's the game? What are we creating in our problems than uh, we earn in cash? Hey, what do we do? See, it's a tiny thing with our city as well. Then that's one of the things that we're concerned about, even as we use algorithms to move to computer generated plastic surgery, right? Uh, do we all want the same nose? Mm-hmm. And yet we probably want to take that perfect nose. Well, then that's going to be very difficult for people who really have that as well. So I may just to close those up because at first we just spot. You know, they do inside the third of the hour. There's always state between it. I think they do sensibilities and plus for those people. And uh, one thing which I mentioned, anytime you start an endeavor, have a moral question. Not put in a very simple way. When you when you get up then you will wonder that that the cop may switch when you take the garage from the garage, you will are you gonna drive like a maniac or and what is the morality behind that? Well, it might be able to put um, other people's lives in danger with that, with that instrument in your hand. So, how do I want to start the car? What is my morally? And the beat. Am I to be distraction to the other people on the street? To be courteous as I try? Or well, I just want to be the first and push everybody aside and just. Mm. So what are they? If anything would be do, there is always a question. How am I going to cut it off myself? That is just what they don't see. The moral question. The starting an endeavor. You do, but the endeavor does not be anything at all. It never simply means I'm going to cut out and take, take a walk. But while I'm walking, what is my mind being respectful to people that pass by? Or I'm just going to be nasty and stupid. So I just put in that kind of basic way. So you can amplify that through and must other ways of conducting. What is my moral principle? What is my, when I do something, we have to have some kind of such a look up, step seeking. Right, that's it, because you mentioned that um, there's a societal law, right? So even in your driving the car analogy, we now have to have a yellow light, a red light, or a green light. This as I think about ethics, it is that intersection with the law that creates that red light, yellow light, and green light. Because without it, some of us just blow the stubborn signs all the time. Thank you. Thank you all very much. In the final moments that we have, are there any last questions from audience members? Seeing no one bit. I do want to offer once again my sincere thanks to all members of our panel for the excellent discussion provided this evening on a fascinating and growing topic. How wonderful is it for this discussion to take place in a university environment, the perfect inversions of academic and practical settings. Looking forward to see how these discussion topics grow from here on out. Thank you all.